is an assistant professor of uh, pediatric neurosurgery at USC. Uh, we have Dr. Anthony Wong, who is a graduate of my program, who's now a uh, faculty member at UCLA across town from Jason. And we have uh, Dr. Amy Bruzek, who's a resident in my program, who uh, will be a fellow at the uh, Washington University uh, Pediatric Neurosurgery Fellowship next year. So the format for today is that we're going to start with a, a short lecture from Dr. Ed Smith, uh, which will uh, take up approximately the first half of the program from 7 to 7.30. And then after that, our distinguished panelists will present cases uh, to the group. Uh, and we'll have a general discussion about each of the cases. We anticipate that there will be three cases presented, each of them taking about 10 minutes each to present and discuss. There is a chat feature, just like uh, all of the Zoom calls that you're all very used to at this point. So if you have questions uh, for the panelists, uh, feel free to include them in the chat and I'll try to uh, make sure that they get addressed uh, to our panel. Uh, so please, uh, please feel free to participate. I think that's really gonna add to the experience for everybody. In addition to that, there's a survey posted in the chat feature. Uh, so uh, we would encourage all of you to access the survey through the chat and let us know uh, what you think of the seminar uh, tonight, as well as the seminar series uh, in general, what we can do to make this a better experience for everybody uh, in the future. So with that, uh, we'll get started. Again, thank you everybody for being here. We really appreciate it. And uh, Ed, over to you. All right. Well, I want to thank the uh, the, the uh, uh, group for the kind invitation to speak with you tonight. I, I thought this was supposed to be six hours of talking, so I'm going to have to really pare this down pretty good. Um, and I was told exclusively by the distinguished panel that I was not to have one word of science in this entire talk. And that's good because I don't know any science, but uh, I will try to keep this very clinically oriented and, and uh, directed towards, you know, those that um, are in training or, or uh, you know, uh, are interested in this. So, uh, you know, I, I see in the crowd, Dr. Scott, who taught me everything I know. So if I say anything right, it's because of him. If I say anything wrong, then it's my own fault. But, you know, I want to talk about AVMs today. And I, I know the audience knows this, but I think sometimes people get so caught up in the nitty gritty of, you know, should I use a right-handed clip on the left side coming in a 30 degree angle? And I think one of the big things is to step back and get the big picture. And, you know, why do we care about AVMs? And, and the short answer is strokes. And, and this is both ischemic and hemorrhagic. And I don't need to tell the group this, except that AVMs are almost always thought of hemorrhagic strokes with a rupture, but there's also an element of ischemic strokes where there can be steel phenomenon. And, and I think it's important to really understand when you talk to your patients, why we're worried about these. Now, when you think about the kind of cerebral vascular disorders that can cause strokes, I think it's helpful to break it down into coherent groups. So you can have damage or occlusion of vessels, you know, you get thrombosis, dissection, spasm, you can have structural changes in pre-existing blood vessels like aneurysms or a dissection. Um, you can get these progressive arteriopathies like moya moya or heritable arteriopathies. And then like we're trying to talk about today, these development of pathologic vascular structures uh, like the vein of Galen malformations, uh, AV fistulas, cavernous malformations, and here, AVMs. So in terms of looking at these, you know, what is an AVM? Um, these are direct arterial to venous connections with no intervening capillary. So everyone drives like they're in Boston. They just shoot straight through from an artery to a vein. There's no intervening slowdowns or anything to stop things. And there's no functional neural tissue within the lesion. Um, they occur in the cerebral hemispheres, the brain stem, the spinal cord, really anywhere there's brain tissue. And by and large, they're embryologic. Um, so you're born with them, uh, like Lady Gaga, <laughs> but they can grow. And, and these are dynamic lesions. Um, they can dilate, they can stretch, they can stenose, uh, they can recruit other blood vessels. And, and as such, I think they're, they're very important to understand that the natural history of these can change. Um, I think, you know, when you, when you look in the big picture, this is the most common symptomatic intracranial vascular abnormality in kids. 
Um, and autopsy series, you know, this is back, you know, decades ago, but it showed that about 1.4% of people have some form of what they called an AVM. Uh, and these were 46 lesions, about 3,200 brain tumor cations. Um, in other studies, we think about symptomatic AVMs, which are the ones I think we're probably more concerned about as neurosurgeons. It's about one per 100,000. Now, what's important is that kids make up almost 20% of all AVMs, and the overall prevalence is about 0.02% of the pediatric population. So they're rare, but if you think about it, in the overall population age distribution, it's really weighted a lot towards kids. So this means that the bad guys, the AVMs that are more likely to pop the bleed to be, to be symptomatic are gonna be found probably younger. And most AVMs present before age 30 or 40, uh, about 20% of symptomatic AVMs will present before 15 years of age. So again, um, that's sort of uh, unevenly distributed, uh, distributed in the population. There's no sex predilection. There's a geographic distribution where they're sort of about one seventh as common as saccular aneurysms. And they're maybe more prominent in AVM in uh, Asian populations, but it's hard to know. Um, in terms of risk factors, you know, there's not really any environmental or lifestyle issues. Um, I would comment that one of the questions I get asked a lot is, hey doc, I got an AVM, either we can't treat it or it's been radiated. How likely is it that it's going to pop or are there are things that I should or shouldn't be doing to make it bleed? And there was a nice paper by Heather Fullerton about uh, eight or nine years ago where she looked at a huge population in the West United States. And there's really nothing that predisposes it to bleeding other than extremely high trauma, so car accidents. Um, and, and, you know, I usually tell people don't do boxing or tackle football, but there's not a lot that will make them bleed. In terms of genetic factors, and again, relevant to the boards, you know, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, uh, that's sort of a, a classic one. Um, this is about 35% uh, or so with uh, kids with HHT will have central nervous system AVMs, and um, about a quarter of them will have multiple AVMs. There are mutations in endoglin, that's HHT1, and ACVRL1 and HHT2, and the juvenile form, the one that we see a lot, typically have mutations in SMAD4. So, and you don't necessarily have to memorize all these except to remember that there are genetic forms and they all affect the TGF beta pathway. So smooth muscle cells are screwed up. They can't bind together well and you get these vascular malformations. And the other big thing that, you know, just for the boards, the KRAS mutations are really, really prevalent in the, in the um, sporadic forms along with BRAF mutations and RASA1. And again, I, I mentioned this, it's not gonna make any difference in the operating room, but it will make a difference in your board. So just something to think about there. So what AVMs do? Why the heck do we care as surgeons? They bleed. Um, they can also injure the surrounding brain by mass effect, by this steel phenomenon. Um, you know, there's mechanical dilatation where this high flow stretches the vessels and it squeezes the surrounding brain. Um, there's also emia and micro hemorrhages with resultant gliosis. And, and this is something you see not just with AVMs, but with um, proliferative angiopathy, which is a different kind of sort of slow flow, big lesion AVM. Uh, but ultimately they act like suction tubes that, that essentially suck the blood away from the nearby healthy brain. Uh, they also get microthrombosis around there and you get this melting brain phenomenon. This is something you see a lot more commonly of vein of Galen malformations, but you know, they're, they're really sort of barely common. And, and I think people underrepresent the steel phenomenon, which can present with seizures or other things. And that begs the question, how do these translate to symptoms, right? So another sort of board question or thing is, how do you know that you have an AVM? Well, the most common is going to be hemorrhage, right? So it bleeds, um, focal neurologic deficits, head fine, they may be asymptomatic, but about four out of five of kids that are, have a known AVM will present with a bleed. And this can be seizures, headache, or you know, either focal or global neurologic deficits. And that is by far the most common presentation. You should also know that if you have an interparenchymal hemorrhage, that is atraumatic. The kid's just walking down the street, kablooey, that's the fancy Harvard term, kablooey, and there's an, a non in the coma. The first thought should be AVM with a couple of spaces beneath it and then tumor. So it's really something to bear in mind as you go through your evaluation because of the potential instability of this. The next question people ask a lot is, how likely are these things to bleed if you find them? 
the rate of major bleeding is about 4% per year, give or take. So on a given year, pretty low, but this adds up over time, especially when you're thinking about the lifetime of a kid. And the overall mortality rate is about 1% per year cumulative. So there can be a real impetus <clears throat> to operate on these, and especially if they have certain risk factors that make them more prone to bleeding that we'll talk about in a little bit. If they do bleed, there's anywhere between a 12 and 25% mortality rate. So what I tell families is all comers, and you can sort of stratify this a little bit by the individual anatomy, but these are bad deals. And the problem is if they bleed, there's a high likelihood that this may be fatal. If they have bled, the rebleeding rates are approximately 6% in the first six months and then about 3% per year after. So the point is the rebleeding rate right after they pop is probably pretty low. And I'll talk a little bit later about how sometimes that's helpful to let some of the clot dissolve if the child is otherwise stable. For an examination, you know, there's not a whole lot here. There may not be any obvious findings on general physical examination. Um, you know, sometimes they'll have some focal weak numbness and a cortical distribution. They may have some visual field deficits. In really big AVMs, you may hear a brewery. That's the thing called a stethoscope. Some of you may not know what that is anymore. I use it for reflex hammers. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, large AV shunts. And this is much more common with vein of Galen malformations in infants, but you can have tachycardia, cardiomegaly, essentially cardiac failure. And this is something to think about again with probably more of the vein of Galen malformations that you see in kids. So let's say you found an AVM you know, now what? The kid comes in either with a hemorrhage or you hear about it. <clears throat> um, you know, pediatric and adult cranial ABMs are rare. And there's relatively limited data on the natural history, treatment, and outcome, although I've given a little bit of that in the previous slides. However, I think there's a consensus to treat ABMs, both in adults and children, if the risk of treatment is low. And I have both, there's the more recent pediatric stroke guidelines. The adult ones came out a couple of years prior. And in general, there are sort of four big options, embolization, radiation, surgery, and then if there's really no good option, the fourth thing is just observation. And it's really risk assessment. So the biggest question that most commonly comes up is do you operate or do you radiate? And so we've published, others have published both in the pediatric literature and the adults that, you know, in general, operations have a very good outcome as does radiation. Um, I would comment that embolism is a standalone treatment unless it is in a simple AV fistula with a single bleeder and a single drainer. Although it's very controversial, uh, in adults, it's a lot more arguable, but in kids, I think there's pretty good data taken from the Aruba trial, which was a big study of asymptomatic AVMs, that embolizing alone can actually worsen the rebleeding rate and make things worse. So my suggestion is, at least in kids, I would not recommend embolization alone based on the data, unless it's a single fistula or very simple AVM. And I know that's going to be controversial. The other thing is I mentioned, what are some of the risk factors that promote bleeding and small AVMs, AVMs in the posterior fossa tend to be more symptomatic, but I would comment that stenosis of an outflow vessel, and I'll show a couple of pictures of this in a little bit, are a very high risk factor of bleeding. And I, if you see that on imaging, that's something to think about maybe to operate sooner and be a little more wary about radiation or delays because of the increased risk of bleeding about four times greater um, if you have outflow stenosis. There's the spetzler martin scale, and there's variations of this that have been in the literature. I think from a trainee standpoint, knowing this is important. This essentially talks about the risk of surgical outcomes. So not necessarily radiation, not necessarily the lesion itself, but if you go in and you operate on something, how likely is it that you're going to have a bad outcome? And there's three big factors, the size of the lesion, as you can see here, whether it's an eloquent or non-eloquent cortex, and then if there's deep venous drainage or not. And so the highest number is associated with a worse outcome and a lower number is associated with a better outcome. <clears throat> and I think this is probably something important to know. Again, there's many, many variations, but if you can understand the factors that go into sort of the main one and the fact that this associates with surgical outcomes, you probably are mostly there for what you need for your boards. This is sort of the takeaway. <clears throat> and again, this is both the pediatric and the adult literature. Um, in general terms, and again, you can argue this across the board, but for a big overview, 
The takeaway is both surgery and radiation are excellent treatment options for, for AVM in the proper circumstance. As a blanket statement, which will never you know, be applied specific to tailor it to a specific patient, but as a blanket statement, the bottom line is surgery has a better cure rate with a faster outcome, meaning the AVM goes away sooner compared to radiation, roughly 90% cure rate uh, and this is a five-year window, uh, compared to about a roughly 80% cure rate for the radiation. Um, again, this is all over the map. There's lots of specific things. We'll talk a little bit about more of those later. But in short, what you're trading is with radiation, you can access things in deeper areas or larger lesions sometimes that aren't as amenable to surgery um, at the cost of a longer length of treatment time and a lower cure rate. Whereas surgery has higher upfront risk, a higher risk of either death or uh, morbidity, but that's associated if you can get through it well with a higher cure rate. So that's sort of a general statement. So with all that background, if this is sort of a talk are aimed at trainees, what the heck do I do as a resident? We've talked about about you need to the boards, the general background. Let's get in the nitty gritty of, all right, I'm on call, AVMs come in, what the heck do I do? And really what I wanna focus on is surgical stuff for surgeons, right? The people on this video thing, they're surgeons. And I really wanna talk about the key things, which are what the heck is the diagnostic imaging? How do you, how do you address it? How do you look at it? Um, the urgency of an operation, you know, how quickly is it that we need to do something? Um, and then I, I think very important, the operating room preparation, you know, what is it that we need to do to be ready? Um, so let's start with a radiographic evaluation. You know, most folks, if they come in, kids or adults with a, with a, you know, sudden loss of consciousness, usually CAT scan is going to be the first thing. <clears throat> and if you see an intraparenchymal hemorrhage, Without a clear etiology, you know, they didn't just get bonked in the head with a baseball bat. Um, think about an AVM and think about a CT angiogram. And, and this is really important to get the lay of the land. If nothing is seen um, and you've done more of an evaluation later, including an MRI or an angiogram, it is important, I think, to repeat the imaging in four to six weeks with an MRI to look at the hemorrhagic cavity to see if something is there after the quad is cleared. And then further testing is sort of dependent on the stability of the patient. But DSA, diagnostic, I mean, digital subtraction angiography, I think is, is really, really important in these kind of questions of AVMs. So here's an example here. And, you know, I like to call on the residents when we're sort of sitting in the same room. I know we're not doing that here, but, you know, when you look at this, this is an, I usually tell the residents, the first thing is stall for time. Ben Stein taught me this at Columbia. You say, what is the kind of picture you know, T2 MRI axial of the brain. And that gives you a few seconds to go through pattern recognition. And don't just jump to the answer. But what you see are these dilated serpiginous vessels in the right frontal lobe. And that's suggestive of an AVM. There are some other th things that are important here. And you'll note that when you talk about an AVM, it's not just the size and the location, but as best you can, are there feeding and draining vessels that you can get any hints from? You can see there's a large vessel here, probably an anterior cerebral vessel. You can see large vessels in the middle cerebral area. So probably fed by the anterior and middle cerebral arteries. <clears throat> you have a clue that there are these large basal veins of Rosenthal. So probably some deep drainage. And then if you look at the brain, it's a fairly atrophied brain, right? It's pretty shrivelly. It looks like an orthopedic surgeon. And so, you know, this tells you there's probably a fair bit of steel, which suggests it's a high flow lesion. So there's a lot you can take away just with an MRI that sets the stage for you when you're speaking to your attending, your team members, and this helps you as you sort of get, you know, set up for what you want to do. Um, the other thing, you know, with, with imaging, many times with these, you're then going to go to an angiogram, right? So you set up for a catheter angiogram, and the kind of things you want to discuss are, is this a high flow lesion or a low flow lesion? This can be very important, and the way you tell that is, do you see an early vein, you know, something that's filling early? I'll show an example of this in a second. That's a clue. If you can't see a small nidus, if you see an abnormal vein, trace that back. It may show you where the nidus is. Um, do you have outflow stenosis? Um, you know, that's a really important problem because if the, if the AVM is constipated, it's going to blow. And, and, and I think that's a very important feature to communicate to your team members. If you see that, look at the venous side. Is the vein tiny? Is there a waste around it anywhere? 
Um, are there varices in the subarachnoid or ventricular spaces? Is there an anatomic boundary? Uh, Dr. Marr and Dr. Scott wrote this beautiful paper about how many AVMs are linear and they end at the ventricle. And this is really important with surgical planning. And it's because of the embryology. If I had science time, I'd talk about the science, but I'm not allowed to talk about science, but it's really interesting. So next talk, we'll talk about that. Um, for the residents, how many and where are the feeding vessels? Um, are there aneurysms on the arterial side or the venous varices on the other side? These are all the features that you want to communicate more than just it's a four centimeter AVM in the right frontal lobe. Uh, these are really critical things because these dictate the treatment options. And I think this is what you want to communicate to the team. This is an example here. If you look at this, right, <clears throat> you can say, here's an arteriogram, lateral picture, carotid injection, and you can see an early vein, right? The superior sagittal sinus up here is filling while you're still in the arterial phase. And that's the thing where you talk about what phase of the arteriogram are you in? And do you see abnormal structures? You shouldn't see venous stuff in the arterial phase. Here you can see also the middle cerebral artery that's feeding this is dilated, it's big. You see very compact nidus and early draining, right? And so you wanna look at this carefully. And one thing you wanna think about here is, you know, where's the feeding, the red, the artery going in, where's the draining? And this is a pretty simple one. This is one going in, one going out. And this is probably a good surgical or possibly embolization case. Um, you wanna think about this like a bomb, right? Cut the red wire, cut the green wire. Think about your surgical planning. If you're gonna operate on this, if you're gonna embolize this, where is the inflow, where is the outflow? Um, suppose you're on call, you get this picture, you see a large interparenchymal hemorrhage here. Um, <clears throat> again, your radar screen is, you know, get me a CTA right away. And if you see a CTA, you can see that the nidus here is on the back part of the AVM and the clots in the front. Why is this important? Well, the green area is your go zone. Let's say this patient's symptomatic from a clot. You can probably get in that and decompress that clot and stay away from the AVM. And I would comment that one of the absolute best tools operatively is real-time ultrasound. So while you're doing your craniotomy, uh, if you use your ultrasound, this will help you to see where the vessels are, where the flow is, and you can direct your decompression. The other thing is when you open the, the bone, sometimes making a little nick in the dura and decompressing some of the clot as opposed to just opening the dura widely right from the word go where you have this sudden transmural pressure change and this thing blows. So just some technical points to think about. Um, here's an AVM, you see sort of a high flow lesion here. Uh, this is before embolization. You can see that the feeders are as big almost as the carotid. So this is clearly a high flow, you know, big lesion. Um, you see after embolization, this shuts down a lot. You wanna be able to describe this to your team and why embolization is important. You may wanna stage it. Um, this is something else I think that's very important that Dr. Scott taught me, which is, you know, complication avoidance. Always think about how you can screw up. And I don't know why he was focused so much on me screwing up, but probably a good thing. And, and this is, these are some practical points away from the science we talked about earlier or the, or the stats, but call ahead to the OR. Um, I think so many times people rush on down in a two minute phone call, even while you're in the elevator or on the way to alert anesthesia, alert nursing, um, make sure there's large bore IV access, blood in the room. Think about adenosine if there's a problem with bleeding. For nursing, what do you need? Multiple suckers, bipolar cautery, uh, AVM and aneurysm clips, um, frameless stereotaxy, maybe if you have time, but certainly an ultrasound is super important. And if you can, have them drape the microscope and have clips ready so that if you're taking the bone flap off and you tear the dura, particularly in adults with older, thinner dura, you're ready to go and you don't have to have your nursing staff draping the scope while you're dealing with bleeding. So just some practical points beyond the theoretical here. Um, the other thing is, you know, these are some principles of AVM resection. You know, obviously you go after the feeders first. A, a key principle of AVM surgery is you do not plug the veins uh, before you take the arteries. Otherwise, if you have blood going in and it can't drain, bad things happen. A second thing is this idea of the ice cream cone. If you think about most AVMs, and this is Cormac and Dr. Scott's paper, where AVMs are usually conical, they're shaped like an ice cream cone. And if you work around it like a water slide, staying close to the edge, but not getting in the AVM, uh, as opposed to just getting down one side and getting in a deep hole, you really get better control of these. If you do get into the AVM by mistake, uh, just put a patty on you. Try not to get into the actual AVM with your bipolar because the, the proteins in the AVM vessels are not normal and they will not cauterize well and you can get yourself into some serious trouble. So sometimes just some tamponade and control is a safer thing.
Uh, Chris Ogilvie used to say this to me, be like a helicopter over a traffic accident. Again, I don't know why I spark a lot of these discussions with people, um, but really zoom out, zoom in as you're taking vessels. Is the brain swelling off the field where you're not looking? Uh, is there bleeding popping up in other places? Uh, is part of the AVM looking like it's going to rupture? You should always, it's too easy to zoom in on one spot. And I think it's very important to consistently with your partner, if you're scrubbed in under the scope, think about periodically looking around and not getting trapped down in a hole. And then lastly, don't dive in. Um, as I mentioned before, these AVM vessels may coagulate poorly and you really want to control them, you know, as best you can without uh, getting into the AVM. Uh, here's an AVM here, shows this nice conical shape that uh, Dr. Scott and Cormac wrote about. It ends at the ventricle. This is a very common ending point for most AVMs. And if you can trace them to the ventricle, you know you're done embryologically. You want to understand where it ends. You can see the AVM here. This is the Chili sign, like uh, the Chili's restaurant. But you can see the, the normal vein and how it's dilated here with this mixing of arterialized blood. This is an important finding. Um, you know, again, the Chili sign here. But you can see how these dilated veins can be prone to rupture, as I mentioned earlier. You want to work around it. And as you sort of get outside the AVM and look at the margin, the veins will purple up and relax. That's a good sign. Here's some onyx here. Um, again, starting at the edges making sure you know where the veins are with ultrasound. They won't always be labeled in this nice blue. Um, and then working in a very deliberate fashion. You want to have a plan, uh, really, when you go into these. You can't just fly in willy-nilly. And you should have the whole plan discussed, if you can, uh, before you get to the operating room if this is elective. When you close, make sure there's no residual nidus. You want to make sure the brain isn't swelling. We get intraoperative angiograms, which I think is very important. Up to 20% of the time, there'll be residual ABM. Look for swelling, bleeding problems. This is why if you have a big AVM, consider stage embolization beforehand. To let the brain adjust and develop alternative vessels. Maybe keep the patient uh, a little sedated or asleep afterwards. Um, this is a little video here in the last, I think I've got about six more minutes. So um, just you know, some general principles here in video, you know, like I said before, the imaging, the urgency, calling the order to prepare. You have this angiogram here, making sure that you really understand where things are. If you can use uh, navigation, great, but if not ultrasound, know where the feeders are, know where the drainers are. Is it high flow or low flow? If you have a catheter angiogram, shoot all the vessels. You may have transdural feeders, uh, and that may be something you can nip in the bud on your way in. Make sure you understand with your team in three dimensions where the feeders are, where the drainers are, how many. Call ahead, blood in the room, three suctions, get your scope pre-draped, have your clips ready. Your table setup is something that is so important and having a nursing or scrub team that knows what they're doing is critical. You want good micro dissection tools so you can really get the arachnoid off and see what you're doing. Big craniotomy, I think these fancy pants, little tiny things are no good go big or go home. You want, you know, as, as uh, they said at Mass General, when I was training, you can compromise on love, but you can't compromise on exposure. You really want to see everything. Um, ICG, I don't use as much anymore, but if there's a problem, you can see if the flow is shut down, you can get a sense that it only show you what you can see. Um, really use the microscope a lot. I, I think it's very, very helpful to have good understanding. Hug the AVM. Um, you, you really, I, I'm a big fan of very, very small, tiny movements. You see my wide exposure here, um, working in a conical shape where you, you, you really are, are working as a team, getting the scope set up so you can have your uh, uh, extra other surgeon directly opposite you it is so, so helpful. Um, if you can use ICG dye, great. We definitely use an angiogram, like a full catheter angiogram at the end. Um, and then obviously do the draining veins last uh, if you can see this, you've got everything dissected all the way around. We've left a little pedicle of the draining vein right here. And, and that's sort of the last thing that you want to attack and make sure that, you know, everything's done. Look for bleeding and problems. Make sure you've got good uh, closure. And um, we use gel foam or Duragen, but you want to make sure the brain isn't swelling at the end. Ultrasound it. Get your intraoperative angio. Don't be afraid of going back if you think there's a problem. Uh, it's better to do it right away than to, to do it later. Um, and then lastly, that you know, follow-up is, is in the ICU is so important. Talking to the ICU team, setting your blood pressure parameters, making sure if they had a bleed, you know, they're on the appropriate meds, um, frequent neuro exams, making sure they're not having outflow problems, really, really important. 
Um, the last thing is, you know, this intraop angio, uh, I've certainly left stuff behind and, and this is the time to tackle it. You don't want this popping in the middle of the night on the day after surgery. And this has been validated by multiple groups. Lastly, in my last sort of three or four minutes here, um, <clears throat> normal perfusion pressure, pressure breakthrough, you know, if it's a high flow ABM, this is a real problem. Um, you can avoid it at the beginning by staging, maybe the little embolization, controlling blood pressure, maybe sedating the patient. Um, really, really important. Um, detailed repeated exams. We get follow-up MRIs at six months and then once a year. And then we usually get a one-year post-op angiogram. We're looking at that now with our series of a few hundred patients and that uh, seems to be important. The last thing is how can we get better? Um, you know, I do wanna talk about 3D printing in the last minute here. We use this a fair bit for complex lesions. Uh, we order them. We can get same day prints really now. It used to be overnight. Um, this is just an example here of how we can use this. Um, you can predict, prick, you know, for an occipital model for trainees, it's a great way to sort of see it in a way you can skeletonize the AVM like this. Um, you know, you can uh, look at it within the context of the brain, oops, sort of in a, in a, you know, transparent model like Superman with his x-ray vision. And then when you're doing the surgery, we'll have the models in the room and you can actually hold them up and look and you can say, okay, you know, if this is the draining vein, here it is right here. If this is the onyx artery, here it is right here. You know, the distance between these two. And if you're sort of deep in the, in the brain for a deeper ABM, understanding this anatomy, I think is just so important and so helpful. So something to think about in terms of, you know, something you might be able to use if they have this at your institution. Um, it, it helps reduce OR time. It helps for training. It's great for trainees. Um, so it's not just the G whiz factor, but, but it actually, I think, shortens OR time and is helpful. So in conclusion, I hope I think I've got my 30 minutes right in the nose. Uh, it's so important. You know, you have all your stats. You have all your things for the boards. We talked about the prevalence and all that. <clears throat> I think speaking surgeon to surgeon, you want to understand the risks, and you do that by getting the imaging and understanding what the anatomy of the AVM is. It's so, so important. You want to really know what your treatment options are. You can't just be a surgeon and only do surgery or be an endovascular person and only do endovascular. Um, you want to have a multidisciplinary group so you can give the best treatment for the patient. And you really want to understand the urgency, not just with a bleed, but is there outflow stenosis? Is there an aneurysm? Is this something that looks like it's changed over time with a lot of edema around it? Um, remember to review the imaging, and I can't overemphasize the idea of having a plan that, you know, before surgery should work backwards and really know what it is that you want to do. Call ahead, coordinate it, and then have a backup plan. So if you have bleeding or you have a problem, how are you going to get yourself out of trouble? So I think that's uh, sort of the time I have here. Uh, it's, a, it's a great field. I've learned some, I've been very fortunate to learn from some great folks. So we'll move on and, and uh, finish up with the second half of, uh, of today's uh, seminar, which is case presentations from our panelists. Uh, again, there is a chat function, which I think is still enabled. So we'd encourage all of you that are still listening uh, in to uh, chat with the, the panel uh, using that function. So first we'll hear from Amy Bruzek. Did Amy make it into the waiting room? Let me see. Oh, I don't think Amy's uh, in yet. I'll text her and get her back. In the meantime, Anthony, are you we, ready? We to got her back. Your... She's here. I don't see her on the list, Jeff. Let's, uh, Anthony, I see, oh, there's Amy, okay. Amy, are you ready to present your case? Yeah, I am. All right, so uh, this uh, first case is actually a case of mine that was a relatively uh, straightforward case, I think, that I managed to make not very straightforward at all um, and uh, ended up not going at all the way we planned. So hopefully it's something people can learn from. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so I'm Amy Ruzek from University of Michigan, and I appreciate this opportunity to present this patient. This is a 14-year-old male with no past medical history who presented to our hospital with a single seizure, first seizure of his life. On our examination, he was neurologically intact. He underwent an MRI that I unfortunately did not have here um, that did show a left parietal arterial venous malformation um, that was just located just posterior to the motor strip. He underwent a um, diagnostic cerebral angiogram, which, as you can show here, shows a left parietal AVM uh, with multiple small arterial feeders and a um, superficial cortical draining vein. Uh, the measurements were about 3.5 by 3.2 centimeter AVM 
our calculator Spessler Martin grade was two um, for its non-eloquent location. This is the dynamic imaging of the angiogram. Again, this is a carotid injection, as you can see. There are multiple small um, arterial feeders and the draining cortical vein and a compact nidus. Uh, the patient underwent uh, embolization with onyx the day before planned surgical resection. Um, as you can see here, this is a static AP and lateral views post onyx embolization. So this is the onyx material uh, with the embolized AVM. It looks here like the entire thing was included. However, on the dynamic imaging of the AP carotid injection angiogram, there are still residual uh, nidus and vessels um, for the um, AVM. So that's the AP view. And then this is the lateral view of the carotid injection with the distal MCA feeders, um, still some nidus. Um, the patient was admitted to the pediatric ICU that night for close monitoring. Unfortunately, at 2 a.m., our neurosurgery resident on the call received a page that there was a decline in the exam. On examination, the patient was somnolent with right hemiplegia. Stat head CT was done, which showed a large left intraparenchymal hemorrhage. The patient was taken emergently to the operating room. A large left parietal craniotomy was performed. Upon opening the dura, the brain was quite swollen with um, quite a bit of cortical bleeding. Um, with some difficulty, we were able to get around the AVM uh, to um, obtain control of all arterial feeders, surround the AVM, um, uh, take the arterial uh, feeders, and then um, lastly, take the uh, draining vein. Uh, this is the post-op um, angiogram, which does show a complete occlusion of the AVM. Uh, my literature review for embolization of AVMs um, revealed multiple excellent um, papers that describe multimodal treatment offering pre-op embolization um, for AVMs. Um, at the University of Michigan, we do do preoperative embolization for grade two uh, AVMs and grade three AVMs. When we do plan surgical resection, uh, we do not do um, standalone embolization. Uh, we do combine it with um, surgical resection and um, SRS uh, when relevant. Um, one of the things I did have difficulty finding was the timing of the uh, embolization and whether that is done same day or uh, the day before. Um, when we would do the embolizations the same day, we did find that we were starting the um, AVM resection in the uh, late afternoon or early evening, um, which was not ideal. Um, so thus my questions for the panelists are, uh, number one, do you embolize uh, prior to low um, surgical resection for low grade AVMs, AVM, particularly grade two? And then what is your exact timing of the embolization? Do you do it the day of, the day before? Um, how do you plan that out? And then in this case, would you have done something differently? So which, uh, which panelist do you want to start talking <laughs> first? Hopefully not the one that was up last. No, thank that's you. A, for... That's a great case, Amy. That's, you know, these can be very tough in terms of um, managing complications from, from pre-op embolization because your goal really was to address the AVM and, and hopefully, uh, sorry, address the AVM electively and hopefully not have any complications in this case. And um, so in my practice, I tend to do preoperative embolization the day before and watch the patient in our PICU. Um, and um, I, you know, in, my, in my experience, it's, it's been quite rare where you have a um, post-embolization hemorrhage, but it can happen. Um, and when it does happen, you do have to address it in a very urgent fashion like you guys did. So I think you guys did all the, the correct steps here. Dr. Wong? So um, I think, I guess the, the way that I think about preoperative embolization is that it's very much an art and not a science. Um, the thing about embolization is, it's, it, it, the preservation of the veins is, is like your goal, is your main goal, right? And so when you, when you risk spontaneous occlusion of the veins, which I'm fairly certain is what happened here, um, you know, that, that's when you get yourself into trouble. And so 
you know, there are some cases where, you know, it's, it's, it's smart to embolize in stages, right, in order to make sure that you preserve the veins. In some cases, you know, it's for, for us, like the way that, that we tend to, to approach embolization is, is a very targeted fashion. So that when, when, I, when I see that much cast on an AVM, it strikes me as, as pretty aggressive, um, especially for something you're going to take to surgery. So the, the things that I tend to use a, a embolization for are for, for, for deep feeders, right? The ones that are going to be hard to get to or, you know, in order to save on blood loss and, for, and as a marker, right? So if there's, a, if there's an empossage vessel nearby, something like that, then I'm going to get confused. And uh, so that, that I find that to be a really useful way to approach embolization. Um, so. Yeah, I, I think that's right, Anthony. I certainly finished my training with the idea of very selective use of embolization. Um, and in, I, I think um, in this case, you're right, there was quite a lot of embolization done to this AVM. The, the interventionalist was very proud of, of the job that he had done and said, I would have a really easy time in the operating room. Um, but uh, as you say, I think it was counterproductive to the extent of the embolization uh, that was done in this case. And I've gone back and forth between embolizing uh, the day of surgery and the day before surgery. And as, as Amy described, I think there are uh, arguments uh, for both. And uh, right now, though, I, as mainly as a result of this case in my N of one, I, I've gone away from embolizing the day before surgery and certainly don't encourage that sort of extent of embolization. What do you think, Dr. Smith? Um, well, I, I don't want to speak for Mike. I, you know, I, I am a little different from him. Uh, so we have, I think, of 280 cases, we just uh, worked on this. We've had two peri bleeds, one fairly significant, one very tiny. Uh, I would comment, I like to do them the day before because I feel that it allows sort of a stage decrease in the blood flow. And similar, I think, was, maybe it was Anthony that said it, but I don't think the goal is to embolize it to cure. Uh, and in fact, I would object to doing that with Darren and with Alfred, I think sort of turning down some of it to let it reroute. Because if you're too aggressive, I think you get that sort of brain constipation I mentioned in my talk. So I tend to do it the day before if I can, both for the convenience reason of starting surgical resection the morning of, but more importantly for the biological region, reason of letting it sort of gradually reroute. And then I, I would agree with the purpose of embolization. I don't do it on everything, but if there's deep feeders, if I think it's a high flow lesion that needs to be gradually turned down in stages, or if there's some really difficult anatomy, if it's a smaller, deeper lesion that's hard to find, having that onyx shows up on ultrasound or, or we get a CTA after with stealth as a marker, those are reasons I think that really help. Okay, great. Dr. Wong, I think you have a case to present to us. Hey, Cormac, just before you move on, did you yeah. was did anything happen in the ICU? I mean, at night, did the pressure go up? Did, was there any warning? The, the, the pressure went up, but we think it went up uh, at the time of the bleed, bleed not, be, not uh, before the bleed. Yeah. yeah, so there was nothing you think could have been done in the, in the unit. You couldn't have kept that patient really down, for example. I think we could have. We didn't. Uh, the patient yeah. was awake. Uh, that night uh, and uh, wasn't being sedated. On the other hand, uh, the patient was neurologically uh, completely well uh, right up into the moment of the hemorrhage. I understand. Okay, Dr. Wong. And again, we're, we're running a little bit uh, late because of the uh, hacker situation that we had. So Anthony, I know you have a number of cases, but let's start by presenting maybe one of your cases. I wanna make sure we have time for Dr. Chu as well. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um... Uh, Dr. Smith uh, mentioned a little bit about kind of some of the uh, congenital or hereditary conditions that that are associated with developing intracranial AVMs, and um, th these these I find to be really interesting cases. And so this is this is one of them. This is a 17 year old woman who presented with uh, unilateral tinnitus um, and uh, was uh, eventually found to have this lesion. Sorry. Let that play. So um, this is a right common carotid injection. Um, you can see that the STA feeds into a um, into a fistulous connection here, um, you know, which is uh, uh, primarily responsible for her tinnitus. And so we we were able to cure that with embolization at the uh, you know on her. Androgram, we notice um, that she does have, you know, a couple of other very small uh, 
um, AVMs. There's one right here. There's one right here. There's one right here. Um, and I'm just showing the this this is the left common injection. There she has a couple of other ones, but I'm just going to show these. Um, and so I was curious to ask, uh, you know, Dr. Smith and, and the other panelists, like what, um, you know, how your approach is different, um, you know, how you gauge the natural history in, in, in the HHT condition, how you treat patients differently. Me, somebody else who, I don't want to hog the conversation. Go ahead, that. Dr. Smith. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's a very interesting series that was presented at one of the French um, endovascular um, meetings right before COVID. And what was found is that with the HHT patients, and these are all of them, not subdivided by the SMAD4 juvenile group versus the others, but they are, I think, I forget the exact number. I want to say 20 times more likely to die of pulmonary complications or systemic complications than brain yes. problems. And as a consequence, I, I think there is probably a, a paradigm shift away from being too aggressive with the intracranial vascular lesions with HHT, the exception being if on serial imaging, there's profound growth, evidence of any of the things I mentioned, you know, outflow stenosis or growth, but they're usually these little tiny things. And as a consequence, I think I personally have become a lot less aggressive about treating these unless I see radiographic changes or evidence of bleed. Uh, I don't know if others feel separately or differently, but uh, even the SMAD4 guys tend to be I think following that rule in general. Yeah, how yeah about you? thanks. Sorry, Anthony, go ahead. Oh, uh, how, about, how about you, Jason? Uh, yeah, fortunately, I only actually have a few of these patients and very similar to Dr. Smith taking a very conservative approach in terms of following the smaller AVMs and addressing ones that either are symptomatic. So I actually have one patient that had a very large fistula and ended up developing venous hypertension. And that AVM got treated, but he also has a number of uh, other smaller AVMs that we've been following conservatively. So yeah, I, I agree with Dr. Smith, things like AVM growth or symptomology or them uh, or hemorrhage. Yeah, thanks for those comments. I, I think that's a really important point that Dr. Smith made. The pulmonary fistulae are the things that kill these patients and they're the things that actually are more likely to give them neurological problems even compared to the brain AVMs because you're gonna get shunting, you're gonna get ischemic uh, strokes from embolic phenomenon, you're gonna get cerebral abscesses. So I think you're right, uh, Dr. Smith, there's been a tendency over the years to get really aggressive about these tiny little wispy AVMs that they get and then ignore the fact that, that they still have an ongoing uh, shunting problem for, through their pulmonary fistula. So very and one of the point. studies showed that abscesses were the more common intracranial finding, actually. Yeah, uh, in terms yeah of we wrote a, a series yeah. of about 300 of these patients, and that was, it was by far the most common uh, cause of neurological problem in, in this population. Um, you know, one thing I struggle with with uh, HHT patients, the AVMs are tiny little wispy things. You don't always see them on MRI, MRA. So who gets an angiogram? You... I mean, in general, we don't we don't get them unless there's a problem. Um, mm -hmm. The new uh, MRAs with um, I forget what they're called, but, but there's a very nice sequence that is done here at Children's that can pick them up pretty well. But honestly, if they're too tiny to see, uh, our model has been that since the natural history is so minimal and they're hard to follow, it's probably not worth putting them through the angiograms uh, unless there's a specific question you're trying to answer. Yeah, that sounds. Sounds like the right thing from, from us as well. Any dissenting opinions? Yeah, I, I mean, my, my practice has been to, to get angiograms like, you know, every five to 10 years or so, um, you know, be, because these things are dynamic, right? They, they, they do develop flow-related aneurysms, you know, either remote or um, within. And, and the next case I was going to show is, is a case where it developed a, both a dynal aneurysm and venous outlet stenosis and, and hemorrhage. So, you know, so the, uh, uh, you know, so what, what Dr. Smith mentioned about, you know, keeps saying about the outlet stenosis, I think is super critical. Like these patients do get, um, you know, high flow stenosing venopathies, um, which, you know, which can definitely affect the hemodynamics and increase the risk of, uh, of rupture and increase the, you know, or I guess, you know, kind of point you towards needing to treat something. All right. Well, thanks, Dr. Wang. Let's move on. Uh, we have just a few minutes left, and I know Dr. Chu has a case that he'd uh, like to present uh, as well. Cool. All right. I'll try and get through this uh, fairly quickly. So thanks for uh, 
inviting me to this. Um, so this is actually a 17 year old that got transferred to our facility after she was found down um, and found to have a fairly large left-sided um, intraparenchymal hemorrhoids, intraventricular extension. When she got here, she was in pretty rough shape. She had a uh, blown pupil on the left. She had right-sided hemiplegia. Um, we obtained a CTA here that showed um, a temporal parietal uh, AVM. Um, and if we look a little bit more closely, there's actually an associated intranidal aneurysm here. And so I think one of the, the, the decision processes in terms of how to best treat this patient is, um, you know, this patient's an extremist. She has uh, signs of elevated intracranial pressure. Um, she's intraventricular hemorrhage. She likely needs to go to the OR for some form of decompression. Um, and the question I think oftentimes is, is there, should we treat the AVM at the same time? Or is this something where we can approach in a staged fashion to let the patient cool down, recover from the acute events, and then uh, and then return to treat the, uh, the AVM? Um, so I had actually elected to uh, proceed with addressing the acute issues in terms of the uh, hemorrhage and the cerebral edema. And this is an intraoperative picture after a decompressive craniectomy where you can see the brain itself is super edematous, very, very full. And even though the AVM itself was accessible on the cortical surface with this large draining vein and the nidus, um, decided to leave that there and uh, allow the patient to cool down and recover before addressing the AVM. And this, there's actually a really nice paper from Dr. Lamb um, that came out just recently that, that looked at uh, her experience in terms of treating initially with decompressive craniectomy and returning for a staged approach. And in and, and, um, her experience, um, there was no difference in terms of morbidity or mortality um, in uh, doing the decompressive crani first and then returning to approach the uh, AVM. So th the other thing with the uh, intranidal aneurysm, we had elected to try and secure that day, day afterwards. So this is a, the angiogram. Um, I apologize, I only left the AP in here, but fairly sizable AVM, uh, mainly fed by uh, distal MCA feeders. Um, and this is the, the um, angiogram after embolization. So we can see the uh, onyx here, which did reduce some of the blood flow and the, the aneurysm here wasn't, wasn't filling. So she actually made a fairly slow but steady recovery in our ICU and um, eventually got transferred to rehab for um, about a six week course. Um, with the intention of returning for a second stage um, surgery for cranioplasty and AVM at the end of a rehab course. She did get a second preoperative embolization prior to the AVM resection. But what was important to note is that she made a fairly significant neurologic recovery um, prior to her second surgery. She was awake. She did have some paraphasic errors and language difficulty, but had recovered a significant amount of strength in her right side. And so I have a, pr a, a brief video of uh, the AVM resection here. So um, here's us kind of working around it, but what's almost immediately apparent is how relaxed the brain is, giving some time for the um, brain to relax and recover from the, the acute events can definitely make the AVM resection a little bit easier. And so this is us kind of working, this is right at the bottom here, and the AVM is able to be uh, lifted out. So in this part here, this is actually some of the hematoma that was evacuated. Um, and I, I tend to place a... Uh, a temporary clip over the top of the draining vein before taking it. And uh, much like Dr. Smith, I do intraoperative angiograms with that clip in place as a, as a marker. So overall, she actually did really, really well. Our intraoperative angio and uh, six-month postoperative angio looked really good. There was no residual. And um, I just saw her in clinic recently at one-year post-op. She was living on her own, ambulating independently, living independently uh, with some rare paraphasic errors and um, follow plan essentially to get um, yearly MRIs, MRAs, and then an angiogram at uh, five years post-op. So yeah, I guess the, the, the question I have for some of the panelists is, would you guys have done anything different? Would you guys have addressed the AVM at the same time as a decompressive crany? And, um, you know, I think some things to really kind of think about are, you know, there's this angio, this AVM had a high-risk feature, had an in, uh, had a nidal aneurysm. There was a big hemorrhage that likely came from the nidal aneurysm, and she was in extremis. Um, we also had suboptimal, or not suboptimal, but incomplete vascular imaging to really define the, the AVM architecture too. So, um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think I would have done anything different. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Chu. I think we would have handled it exactly the same way uh, at our place. It, you know, it, it, obviously these are unusual situations. Most AVMs are either 
uh, unruptured or if they're ruptured, usually we can just watch and wait with a hemorrhage and, and wait for it to resolve without surgery. So fortunately it doesn't come up very often where the clot's big enough to demand surgical treatment um, uh, with an AVM uh, uh, you know, adjacent to the clot. But when that's happened, we've tried to, as you say, just do a craniectomy or, or address the clot and then uh, wait for the AVM. Uh, treatment uh, in a delayed fashion. It just, it seems like the surgery is much more controlled and goes much better under those circumstances. The intranidal aneurysm, sort of a special circumstance there. Sometimes mm -hmm. if, if there's an endovascular treatment for that, we might do that acutely and then wait on definitive AVM treatment. How about the other panelists? Yeah, I, this is, this, like the, the approach that you took is, is, is what I would consider to be the default, you know, like my, my default approach to these. I think that's really, really smart the way that you guys handled it. There are a few situations where I'll go ahead and take out the AVM and it's kind of dependent on, you know, having vascular imaging that, you know, that, that, that I consider to be adequate to kind of show the, the architecture of the AVM, right, which sounds like you didn't have. But for these lateral parietal occipital AVMs, like, you know, they're probably going to have superficial drainage. Um, they're going to have these like meat or lateral posterior choroidal artery feeders, which is probably where your aneurysm came from. And so, and then if there's a big clot, right, the, the idea of like letting it, letting the clot sit and liquefy and stuff is to make your comeback surgery uh, safer, right? Um, so if, if I'm able to, if the clot is, you know, comes out easily, if I'm going to do a, a, you know, a clot evacuation and, um, and, and, and you can see the deep aspect of it adequately, then in those cases, I'll, I'll just go ahead and take it out. Um, yeah. Thanks, Dr. Wong. Dr. Smith? No, I 100% agree. I, I would comment, we just submitted a paper looking at something that we, uh, we I think Shivani was on the call earlier, but uh, split nidus syndrome, where Mike showed me a couple of these cases earlier, but where the AVM actually splits in two uh, based along the pedicles of the vasculature, and you can miss those at the time of surgery. So my only comments would be, I would agree with this strategy. Sometimes you got to take out the AVM if you're in deep, deep trouble, but I really prefer not to. And I think that that idea of two things, one, using ultrasound intraoperatively with uh, Doppler imaging is so helpful to know where you are in real time when the brain's all swelling. And two, um, not just opening the dura all at once, but making that little slit, doing a cordisectomy with your sucker in with ultrasound guidance in real time, you can really relax the brain so that when you open the dura, you don't get that transmural pressure shift and the whole brain doesn't bloop out at you. So those are just some practical points I think are so important. And the rebleeding rate, as I mentioned, in that interval of six weeks is so low. Uh, again, I think we looked at 280 patients. I forget how many were intra, I, I want to say it was over 100. And I, I don't think we had any knock on wood intra period ruptures uh, between. So I would 100% agree with the strategy and just point out those little practical measures that we've used. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I 100% I, I agree. Ultrasound is so useful during these cases, you know, whether it being visualizing the nidus or at the, at the end of surgery or before surgery, if you're placing an external ventricular drain, you can definitely, you have the ability to target the ventricle. And I actually have, a, you know, while you were talking, I found this one picture that I have from, a, a, let me see if I can, let me see if I can share it too, uh, if we have time. Of, okay, go, go ahead, Doug. Of, um, of the Doppler portion of the ultrasound, which once again is, is incredible. Um, and so this was actually a patient, unfortunately I didn't have any of the angios, but they, I hope that's popping up okay. So they had a, a tiny AVM that hemorrhaged and there was a single feeder, single draining vein. They got embolized at an outside facility. And six months later that AVM returned and um, couldn't embolize it again. So we elected to take it to the OR. And this is, you know, it was a very, very tiny nidus. But using the ultrasound, in addition to navigation, we're able to really localize it. And you can see here with the Doppler images, you can see this, this night is just kind of mixing. So the, the ultrasound is such a useful tool. All right, thanks. 